Hey, what's up, you lot? Path here, and today we are finally going to have a chat about the topic. Let's chat about spin. In the context of quantum mechanics, of course, we're not talking about cricket here. If you enjoy this video, then please subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content and hit that bell button to be notified whenever I upload, usually 4 p.m. UK time on Tuesdays. Also, I'd like to say a big thank you to this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Check out their free trial, Skillshare Premium, by clicking the first link in the description box below. All right, let's get into the video. Now, spin is often discussed in quantum mechanics, usually as a property that electrons seem to have. But what exactly is spin? Well, one of the key things that we need to understand about spin is that it's a type of angular momentum. Some of you might already be familiar with angular momentum. Objects that are spinning or rotating or orbiting another object, essentially objects that have angular motion, have angular momentum. This is slightly different to the linear momentum that we learn about at school. Usually we just call it momentum, which is what an object has when it moves along a straight line. You might recall that the momentum of an object, the linear momentum technically, is found by multiplying the mass of the object by its velocity. And angular momentum is similar in many ways, but it's associated with angular motion rather than linear motion. The interesting thing about spin though, is that certain particles seem to have inherent angular momentum. That is, it's not caused by them rotating about another object or spinning around or moving along a curved path. They seem to behave as if they are spinning, hence why we call it spin. When particles have angular momentum, they behave in a very particular way, for example, in a magnetic field, and these particles seem to behave that way. And any angular momentum that they gain from actually moving along a curved path or orbiting some other object is on top of the inherent spin angular momentum that they already have. Weird, right? So what gives? Where does this inherent angular momentum actually come from? Well, it turns out that this behavior comes from special relativistic effects in quantum mechanics. This is an interesting topic of discussion, and I'd like to save it. I think I'd do it more justice in a video that I'd like to make in the future about the Dirac equation. Oh, and by the way, just a quick aside, some of you might be thinking right now, weren't scientists struggling to relate quantum mechanics and relativity together? Wasn't that one of the big questions in physics? Well, interestingly, quantum mechanics and special relativity seem to work quite well together. Quantum mechanics and general relativity, on the other hand, not so much. At this point, I'd like to point out that lots of different particles have spin. But for now, we'll stick with electrons because those are probably the easiest to deal with. Some of you might be familiar with the idea that an electron spin can be measured in one of two different states, usually called spin up and spin down. What this actually means is that our electron can have this inherent angular momentum that makes it behave as if it's spinning either clockwise or anti-clockwise. For simplicity, even if we don't consider this weird quantum relativistic behavior, when just dealing with normal classical angular momentum, we like to put an arrow, a vector, through the center of this rotation in order to represent that rotation. We could choose an upward pointing arrow for a clockwise rotation and a downward pointing arrow for an anti-clockwise rotation. And so that's where the idea of spin up and spin down comes into the picture. Now it's worth noting that what I've mentioned so far is a little bit hand wavy and a little bit eh, but as a general introduction to spin, it's a good start. Now, before we go any further, I'd like to take a moment to thank this video's sponsor. Please check out the first link in the description box below for their free trial. I am of course talking about Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can find a large number of inspiring classes focusing on topics such as productivity and lifestyle to building a career or business to learning creative skills in areas like music, film, and web development. As many of you will know, I'm a huge advocate for having multiple passions in life. And I've taken a few classes on Skillshare that have been genuinely eye-opening to me. For example, I took a class called Simple Productivity, How to Accomplish More with Less by Greg McEwan. And he provided some simple and easily actionable ways in which we can boost productivity. Skillshare has a large number of classes to choose from and it's all about learning, so there are no adverts. Most classes are less than an hour long, which means that it's not a major commitment to sit down and learn something new. And Skillshare costs less than $10 a month with an annual subscription, however, if you click the first link in the description box below, you'll get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. Do check it out and big thanks to Skillshare once again for sponsoring this video. Okay, let's come back to spin. By the way, if you wanna figure out how we can tell that these electrons behave as if they're spinning without them actually spinning or rotating, check out something known as the stern gerlach experiment. Now, what does it really mean for us to measure the spin of an electron? Well, in rather abstract terms, the first thing that we have to do is to choose the direction in which we want to measure the spin. 
Again, for more practical details, check out the Stern Gerlach experiment. It's really interesting. But so let's imagine that we choose to measure the spin of our electron in this direction, say. The two possible results that we can get from this experiment is either we find our electron spin aligned with our measurement axis or anti-aligned. Importantly though, we're just measuring the component of our electron spin along the chosen measurement direction. According to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, if we know something about the spin in a particular direction, then we absolutely cannot know anything about the spin in any perpendicular direction. As soon as we make a spin measurement in our chosen direction, our electron's wave function collapses so that we have information about which way the spin is pointing, either up or down, but we know nothing about whether the spin is pointing left and right or in and out of the page. Screen. Screen. I'm not writing a book. And if we choose to make a measurement in a perpendicular direction, then all the information that we had about our spin in the vertical direction is lost. All of that now becomes uncertain. We just know whether the spin of the electron is pointing left or right. In other words, this is not a byproduct of bad experimental methods. It's not that we don't have the skills or the equipment needed to work out the, the spin of this electron in all three directions. It's built into the universe, at least according to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If this amazingly mind-blowing idea is relatively new to you, then I'll leave some resources in the description box below, as well as recent videos that I've made on the topic. Now, we've talked a little bit, only a little bit, about what spin actually is and what it means to measure the spin of an electron. But another important thing to know about spin, just like lots of other quantities in quantum mechanics, spin is quantized. In other words, when we make a measurement of an electron spin, obviously we've seen it can only be pointing up or down, equivalent to like a clockwise or anti-clockwise rotation about our measurement axis. But more importantly, the size or the magnitude of this spin can only be a particular value. In our classical analogy of our electron actually spinning, this is equivalent to our electron only being allowed to spin, either clockwise or anti-clockwise, at a very particular rate. It can't spin any faster and it can't spin any slower than this. But now here's a really important bit. Remember how I said earlier that other particles can have spin? Well, not all other particles are quantized in this same way. Not all particles show two possible spin measurements, spin up or spin down. Photons, for example, have three possible spin measurements. And there are also particles that can be found in one of four different spin states, or five different spin states, or six different spin states. I'd like to link this to common numerical descriptions of spin that you might see. Some of you might have heard of electrons being called spin half particles, and photons being called spin one particles. What does this mean? Whenever you hear that a particle is a spin n particle, whatever n might be. The first important thing to note is that n will always either be an integer, a whole number, or a half integer. In other words, you can have spin zero particles, spin half particles, spin one particles, spin three over two particles, spin two particles, and so on. This refers to the magnitude or size of the angular momentum that a particle can have. Specifically, the number refers to the maximum angular momentum a particle can be found with when we take that number and multiply it by h bar the reduced Planck constant. So a spin half particle can be found with a maximum spin angular momentum of one half multiplied by h bar. But interestingly, we can also use this number to figure out how many possible spin states our particle can have. The way to do this is the following. Let's say that we're working with a spin half particle, like an electron. Now we already know the angular momentum that our electron can have in one possible state. As we said, it's half h bar. And then, we take our spin number and we subtract one from it. This gives us the angular momentum our particle can have in another possible state. In this particular case, minus half h bar, which just means the same sized angular momentum, half h bar, but pointing in the opposite direction. Or in other words, spinning the other way. Now for an electron, that's as far as we can go. Because as soon as you hit the negative value of the original spin number, you stop. Those are all the possible states we can have. So for an electron, there's two possible states, one with the angular momentum plus half h bar and the other with the angular momentum minus half h bar. Let's look at another example. I said earlier that a photon is a spin one particle. So we start with this number one, we multiply it by h bar. So we find that h bar is the maximum angular momentum we can find for our particular photon. Then for the next possible state, we subtract one from this number, giving us zero. And then we can find another state with the angular momentum negative one h bar, or just minus h bar. And at this point, we've reached the negative value of our initial spin number, so we stop there. A photon has three possible spin states, one with angular momentum h bar, one with angular momentum zero, and one with angular momentum negative h bar. 
this example is a little bit dodgy, by the way, because for photons, the zero angular momentum state is not allowed. But that's for very different reasons. The point still stands. This is how you would calculate all possible states our particle could be in. A particle described as being spin 3 over 2 has four different states. In one of them, you find the particle with an angular momentum 3 by 2 h bar. In one of them is half h bar. In one of them is negative half h bar. And the other one is negative 3 by 2 h bar. And that's it. So the spacing between spin states is actually h bar, interestingly. And so that's how you can calculate all of these spin states and the angular momentum that the particle will have in each particular state, simply by knowing its spin number. But the coolest thing that I can mention here is that all particles with half integer spin display very different behaviors to all particles with integer spin. In fact, particles with half integer spin are known as fermions, and particles with integer spin are known as bosons. An electron, therefore, is an example of a fermion, and a photon is a type of boson. If you don't know about these two classes of particle, then please do check out this video I made a little while ago talking about them in more detail. Now, there is so much more we can say about spin and all of the far-reaching implications of this idea, but I won't. At least not here in case I overload the video. If you enjoyed what we've talked about so far, then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Feel free to hit that bell button to be notified when I upload and do check out the free trial for Skillshare Premium in the first link in the description box below. Feel free to check out my Patreon as well on patreon.com forward slash pathg. And thank you all for watching and for your wonderful support. I'll see you really soon.